Um, so, welcome. Uh, this is the panel on SESTA-FOSTA and its impact on sex-positive websites. Um, just to introduce ourselves, this is a three-person panel, so I don't anticipate having to do a lot of moderating, uh, per se. We'll try not to talk over each other. Um, my name is Mary Throes. Uh, I'm a policy counsel at Public Knowledge, uh, which is a consumer advocacy group based in Washington, D.C. Uh, we do a lot of work on telecommunications, tech policy, intellectual property. You'll see me on some of the cell phone privacy panel earlier if you were there. I'll be on a net neutrality panel tomorrow. I'll be on what about fair use. Um, yeah. We just hang out like every year. Um, so yeah, that's uh, kind of where I'm coming at it from. Uh, we worked a little bit on SESTA-FOSTA. Um, we weren't as sort of elbow deep in it uh, as some other folks, but we're, you know, I'm kind of here for the insider DC sort of perspective on how it all went pear-shaped. I see about half of you from the last panel, so I, I know you heard this before, but my name is TJ Myhill. I'm a, a business and internet uh, technology lawyer here in Atlanta. I deal with mostly litigation issues, uh, uh, some trademark and copyright claims, uh, and, and we've, uh, I've, I've represented a number of people in the, well, adult or adult tangential industries uh, in, a, in a variety of either uh, transactional or, or, or litigation efforts. So, uh, and I have a very strong opinion on internet, uh, internet issues and internet safe harbors, and you will hear them all today. Um, I'm Adrienne McDonald. I am a personal development coach, and my focus is uh, mostly So I thought we'd kind of just sort of briefly give some background on SESTA FOSTA um, without getting too much into the sort of underpinning legal needs um, and then kind of talk about what the law looked like, what it, because sort of how the progression of this bill happened and then what the sort of fallout has been, um, but mostly reserve time for questions because this is a topic where if you really wanted to get into the nitty gritty, you could have like a two hour solo talk about it. Um, and like literally no one wants that because you'd all be asleep. <laughs> um, so very high level. Um, there, <laughs> way back when, uh, there was this law called the Communications Decency Act. Uh, now this was back in the late 90s. Janet Reno was the, uh, the attorney general at the time. Um, and essentially, it was an attempt to do a bunch of different stuff vis-a-vis -vis the internet. It was an attempt to restrict, basically, the ability of children to access pornography, which is how this is always sold. Um, and it had a bunch of different provisions. The Supreme Court struck down all of them, except there was one provision, which is Section 230. It's called CDA 230. Um, and you hear that bandied about a lot uh, if you follow sort of tech news. The basic idea behind Section 230 uh, kind of, co it came from a very specific line of court cases. Um, the idea behind it, so the, the court cases underlying this were essentially, uh, what do they had to do with what do platform, what responsibilities do platforms have when people post stuff on your bulletin board system at, at the time? Um, and there was at least one case where yes, we are that old. Shut up. <laughs> um, the, uh, there was at least one case where essentially one, I don't remember what service it was, went in and actually tried to moderate posts to some extent, and the court looked at that and said, oh, you're moderating it, so you're controlling what's on it, which means that you're basically a publisher for the purposes of the law, but analogizing them to a newspaper publisher, and you hold newspaper publishers liable when they print something that is false or illegal or any other host of things. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can't put in print without being legally liable. Um, and they basically said, yeah, you know what, now that you're exercising some control over what's on your platform, you are now officially responsible for all of it. Uh, yeah, and if that wasn't a categorically terrible idea, I don't know what was. And so Section 230 of the Communications and Decency Act basically came about as a result of that. And what it said was, listen, courts, for the purposes, first off, that's not how this works. Second, for the purposes of liability, with some exceptions, um, Child pornography, I think, has always been excluded from CDA 230, and copyright infringement, which has its own special sets of provisions and penalties. 
um, because copyright is always special. Uh, basically, it said, you know, as long as the site takes good faith steps to remove this stuff when it crops up, you cannot hold them liable like you would hold a newspaper liable. They're not publishers for the purposes of liability. Um, and the idea being, you needed to give these sites the, the legal wiggle room to actually be able to moderate their content, because otherwise the incentive is to just leave it as a wild west, uh, where anything can happen, and every legal incentive is just to keep your hands off of it. Um, now, Cesta Fosta came about for a lot of things. Uh, essentially, you can blame Backpage. Uh, Backpage was a website uh, that is no longer with us um, because of this. It's with the FBI now. It's, it is very much with the FBI. Um, Backpage was essentially a website that, among other things, advertised for sex. Uh, a lot of sex workers used it voluntarily, and then there were a lot of accusations of not only um, using it for sex trafficking, sex trafficking of children, um, but also uh, that they there were accusations, though I don't think they were ever borne out by evidence, that like they would approach these sort of sex traffickers and say, hey, we've got 230, no one can prosecute us, wink, wink, uh, and that they kind of flaunted it. And they were just sort of the characteristic bad actor in a lot of ways. Um, add this to the fact that as a state, so generally uh, is sex trafficking is considered a federal crime, mostly because it always happens across state lines, almost always, um, and sort of by definition if you're trafficking someone. Um, and generally it's up to the feds to prosecute these crimes. Well, the feds are under-resourced and strapped, uh, and it is considered a hard case to bring when you have something like Section 230 immunizing the platform. Uh, and so state attorneys general basically got frustrated and said, look, we need to be able to prosecute these things, but we can't because of the way the law is structured right now. Like, it has to be the feds, and they are sucking at their job. Uh, and so the response to this, rather than just writing a law that says, yes, you may go forward and prosecute these things, uh, they decided to write SESTA FOSTA. Um, and SESTA FOSTA, SESTA stands for the Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking Act, and FOSTA is the Allow states, allow states to, we don't, we don't, <laughs> don't that. An we don't do an anagram for that one, allow states to uh, fight online sex trafficking act. Um, and the official name of the bills it passed was SESTA FOSTA, because everyone had to get their fucking acronym in there. <laughs> um, essentially what it did is it was like, well, you know, first off, no one's entirely sure what it did. <laughs> That's part of the problem. But they, they drafted it in such a way that said like, well, if the website is aware that someone is using it for sex trafficking, then you're liable. Uh, and it's, it's the, the degree of knowledge is a very, and that was part, a lot of the fight was basically that the, the way this was drafted was so sloppy that the question about like, what constitutes knowledge? Right. Uh, and what constitutes like facilitating and aiding in any way sex trafficking? Like guess what? Every website in the universe aids sex trafficking in some way. Facebook doesn't allow prostitution ads, but people absolutely find each other through that. Um, people distribute files through all kinds of intermediaries. Um, and so what's the, you know, it's a law that is kind of a big hand wave. Uh, and it, it's in many ways amounts to the like, we'll know you when we see you kind of legislation, um, which is a disaster recipe for a lot of reasons. So. Mm. Well, and, and let's be clear, Section 230 is the foundation of the internet as we know it. The reality is that absent the safe harbor in 230 and the affiliated safe harbor in the DMCA, no website in the world would allow you to post any content. You couldn't post anything, you couldn't comment, you couldn't, there would be no interaction. It would be my website showing you my vacation pictures and you would have no way to call me a boring tool bag. And so the internet would not be what we know. The internet would not exist as we know it if it exists at all, but for the fact that you can put whatever stupid crap you want on the internet and whoever's hosting it isn't immediately and inherently liable for your stupid crap because you can violate people's copyrights you can violate no shortage of laws by anything you post. And I may never see it. I mean, it's one thing if you're commenting on my, my vacation website, but it's another thing if you're commenting on Reddit. I don't care how many moderators you have, you can't read every single thing posted on Reddit. So, and I've tried, 
usually during work. You want to. But <laughs> yeah. so 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 there there just wouldn't be a way to allow it, and without that safe harbor that is now being chewed away at, we wouldn't have what we now have as as society. Um, and I will just throw this in there from the policy perspective. So I primarily, most of my time is spent working on copyright related issues for which safe harbors, as TJ pointed out, there is a safe harbor for, for folks who basically, for websites when they find that someone has uploaded copyright material onto their website and there's a procedure that they have to follow, sort of loosely defined, to take it down upon request. Um, content companies have loathed this for a long time. They would love to be able to hold intermediaries intermediaries, which is the legal term of art for the like hosts, the, the websites that host these things, um, they would love to be able to hold these websites liable. Because if you think about it, if you're a record company and you find a pirated, I'm going to put scare quotes on that, uh, copy of your song hiding out somewhere, what are the chances you're going to find the guy who pushed the upload button? Like, chances are pretty low to nothing in a lot of cases. Um, you know, you can, it's, it's, Often they're anonymous, often they're overseas and unreachable. You know, the guy vanishes, shows up under a different username. There's a million different obstacles to you doing it. So they want to go after the stationary target, usually that's pretty deep pocketed, which in many cases is Google uh, or Facebook or Amazon or who, like, it is a very, like, you know, and I'm not going to feel, I'm not telling anyone to feel sorry for Google. Like, they are richer than, you know, richer than God at this point. Um, having said that, like, it is, that is that has always been the dynamic there is is who has the deep pockets that we know we can get money out of for the wrong that is being done to us in a legal sense um and content industry looked at sesta fosta and they were very invested in this fight not because it affected anything that they did directly but they were able to get this rhetoric now coming out of people saying like safe harbors are bad we should always hold these intermediaries liable for what goes up on their site you need to be responsible da 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 and now the pivot is to like well we've all agreed that the intermediaries need to be liable so maybe we need to hold them liable for copyright infringement and so this was very much it's like it's not at all conspiracy theory to say this was absolutely the opening volley uh, right. in a copyright fight uh, and that is where this is going. Next. Absolutely. I, the, the first thing is, I, I, we, we, I, I promise we'll get to the sex workers. We will. But the, fun stuff. the, the, the problem with SESTA FOSTA isn't just that it has failed to do what it was supposed to do, in fact, made it harder to do what it's supposed to do, and also screwed everybody else in the process out of screwing people in the process. Um, but it, it, it is the first bite on Section 230. And my primary question, because this is the one that affects me as a non-sex worker, is what's the next bite? And what's the bite after that? And where do those bites leave us, if anything? And so that is, that is my biggest concern about this act, is not its immediate and direct effect of this act itself. It's the fact that we have now decided that taking a bite out of the safe harbor is OK, because that is absolutely terrifying. So, Adrian, did you want to talk kind of about what you've seen, like some of the fallout from the... Yeah, I, I've seen... Well, the, the sex is still happening. I, I just want to let you know. <laughs> Thank God. I promise. I promise. Uh, because we're very creative creatures, human beings are. So, they went back and, um, like, the big tech companies just did this blanket, okay, Craigslist, no personals. Um, I think Google Drive started wiping stuff off without any warning at yep. all. They just stuff just disappeared yep. for people. Um, they're for like the low hanging fruit, right? Because adult content is so subjective. So if they even thought that it was going to be a problem, but even prior to Sesta Fosta, like on uh, Facebook, for instance, I know a number of sex educators that do retreats and what they can't run ads. I mean, there's there's all there were already all these rules, and this was just this just added on mm -hmm. to it. Um, but there uh, there have been some creative solutions. I mean, there is um, uh, a former, actually, I think she's still a sex worker, that actually started a company that the servers are offshore. They're in um, Iceland, I think, and they're sex worker friendly, and that's how she she advertises. 
Um, and then I think it's intimate.io uh, started blockchain to because the the <laughs> now cryptocurrency is getting into it, right? I just sorry, I just I as someone who works in DC tech policy, every time someone says the word blockchain, I, my eye twitches a little bit. Um, blockchain is a solution to everything, Meredith. And sometimes it actually is a solution. No. <laughs> in when this I game, say maybe. cryptocurrency, like, I two yeah. percent of the yeah, time. All, all of it. So, but that those are the types of things that are coming up. Um, there's now uh, Twitter. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there there are these pop up solutions but all of it is offshore somewhere else and it tends to be in Austria, Iceland and Netherlands, thank you. So and that that's the workaround. So again uh, the sex Dutch. is still happening. <laughs> I had some Icelandic clients. Vikings are awesome. So the problem that the normal individual sex worker has though is that that's that's great if you have the resources to move your your, your, your material to Iceland. That's, that's fantastic if you can set up your own organization. It's not so good if you're the girl or guy who was advertising on back pages and now has lost every um, you know, means of, of, of accessing and, and, and contacting clients and you find yourself either out of work completely or working through means you didn't choose to work. Um, and that is that is a, a real outcome of SESTA and FOSTA is it's taken away these opportunities for people who don't have the opportunity to set up their own independent operation outside of the jurisdiction. There's always going to be a solution. People like fucking. Just, I know that's surprising to everybody, but the, the problem that the less affluent sex worker is having is that they don't necessarily have the opportunity to do some of the workarounds that that are being offered and now they have to assume a lot more risk yeah yeah a lot more risk so and there has been some fantastic coverage about the fallout of this among sex workers um there was a long piece in the atlantic about it mm -hmm. i mean it's it's all you can just literally google sesta fosta fallout and mm -hmm. there's a yeah. website that all it does is just track all the sites that have changed their policies that have shuttered completely um folks who gave um a dom lessons there was a really interesting statement by one sort of professional dom coach who said i can no i'm not offering classes anymore because i can no longer in good conscience charge people for my classes when i know they can't make a living off of it um as a result of sesta fosta um but yeah it's pretty well documented and it's pretty it's it's pretty bad and, and this is all, I mean, you know, again, we've talked about the big ones. We're talking about, you know, Craigslist, Google Drive. By the way, let's all take a moment to appreciate the fact that Google Drive deleting people's photos means that Google's going through and looking at everybody's photos to make sure whether they're adult or not. I've been saying for years that, you know, we should be more worried about Google than the NSA, but, you know, I just keep speaking into the void. But the, 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 the big players obviously are are you know impacting your direct content, your direct advertising, your direct photos you're selling, your direct whatever you may have out there. But it's affecting the entire practice. The reason people are going to cryptocurrency is because Bank of America won't host you anymore. Bank of America won't give you an account because I'm I might be, you know, uh, aiding a, a, aiding sex work. I might be aiding sex trafficking. If I take money from someone who is engaged in an adult business, what if that adult business is suddenly defined as as as, a, as an illegal entity? I'm now Bank of America liable, uh, and, and I'm not using Bank of America, Wells Fargo, any of the banks. The the, the banks are stopping are doing business. Um, you know, regular non non-tech companies are stopping doing business because it, it, it impacts soup to nuts. The idea that if I am aiding or, or, or implementing the, the sex trafficking in is, any way, in any way, it's such a broad umbrella that literally anyone can, can, can fall victim to it. And so it, it's causing problems, not just with, oh, I can't advertise on Craigslist anymore. It's, oh, I no longer have a checking account to pay my rent, if I can even get money to pay my rent. So the, uh, Cindy Gallup, who was the founder of Make Love Not Porn, went and tried to get a commercial account with Chase. 
they not only told her no, they actually shuttered her business account when she was in the midst of getting her funding. At the time, she had, I think, $500,000 in seed money, and so she was ramping up. And they're like, no, no, you need to go away. She since has gotten two million from an angel investor from overseas, um, and that and that's how she's doing it. And because we were talking about sex positive websites, how is this affecting? And she was one of the big ones that came up. Also, um, Cora, I think it's Cora Heading Headinger. She's the lingerie addict. She has a new book out. She is one of the largest lingerie bloggers, and she was interviewed recently. And it's like, are you concerned about sesta pasta? And she's like, well, of course I am, because I could be classified in that particular realm. So I think we had a couple of questions. Um, we got. Do you have the? <coughs> Thank you. Got, you. All right. All right. Oh, awesome. A very foundational question. Is SESTA FOSTA opening up avenues for criminal culpability, civil liability, or both like RICO statutes? I believe it's both. I think it's both, too. I think it's both. Yeah. both. And that's, again, um, SESTA FOSTA. I, yeah, I was joking with the other tech policy. So there's like a bunch of, there's a whole contingent here from EFF. You've probably seen if you come to any of these panels. Um, unfortunately, they weren't able to, t partly because they're actually suing about SESTA FOSTA right now. So they're a little constrained in what they can talk about. Um, but, you know, I sort of joke that, like, I'm just going to get up there and wave my hands and say it's all very legally complicated. And they're like, actually, no, that is 100% accurate. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was, and this is the interesting thing. 230, there were already carve-outs for criminal activity. Like, you could not knowingly host criminal activity. That has never, right. ever, ever been allowed. Um, you cannot solicit ads for murder on your webpage. Like, that is, not, that is not a thing you get to keep immunity for. Be like, I need you to stab my husband. Well, you, you don't get away with that. Um, and arguably, you couldn't get away with hosting child pornography or, or sex trafficking either. But, like, now it's the this, this scope of, like, well, what does it take for you to know that it's happening is the, is the big question. Um, and I believe... Going back to your point, I think it is both civil and criminal liability. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to ask a foundational question. Um, we hear so much about sex trafficking, so define for us what sex trafficking really is and isn't, because I, I think just, it's, it's getting to the point where almost any, anything anybody doesn't like that's sexual is, is being labeled sex trafficking these days. Yeah, I actually don't know the legal definition of it. I feel like well, that's a trafficking, on my Well, trafficking part. should have a very precise definition. So trafficking historically has meant transporting, uh, transporting a person across state lines for the purposes of an illegal act. Um, and specifically transporting, you are, the, you are doing the transporting of another person. It is not that other person volitionally crossing. So it's basically transporting something against their will. Um, if you look at early trafficking statutes, you had sort of like the white slavery panic. Uh, was the Man Act? There's like what? Yeah, so it was like the Man Act, which is was like, you cannot transport a girl across state lines for illicit purposes. Was one of them. Um, and there was a famous boxer who just got posthumously exonerated because essentially what these laws were used were to go after black men who were dating white women. Mm -hmm. That was that was what these laws were used to prosecute. Um, and. So that is like the technical definition. As far as sex trafficking, if I had to, I, I do not off the top of my head know what the specific definition, but my educated assumption on this is that it is transporting an individual across state lines against their will for the purposes of prostitution, essentially, um, for the purposes of engaging in a sexual act for money. Sorry. Coercively. Right, well, you know, again, sorta. The, 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 the problem that a lot of these laws have is that we assume it's all coercively, right? right? If I put you in the car and drive you across state lines to have you have sex with someone, that presumes that I am your pimp and I am forcing you to do it and you might as well be duct taped in the trunk as opposed to you needed a ride. And the, the reality of the law is you needed a ride is still potentially prosecutable under a, a lot of these statutes. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm a real life sex worker and no offense to y'all, no clapping, no clapping, I'm fine. 
No offense to y'all, but it's a little ridiculous that there's no sex workers on this panel. I, like, honestly, I, like not not the three of you, but like to the organizers, two things. First of all, like oh, kind of offensive, honestly. <laughs> like my hands are shaking that there's no sex workers on this panel. Like you guys have brought up way more and way better points. Jam. Than I expected. Seriously, I don't need. I don't mean to shame any particular. No, seriously. Person. I'm serious. You like, come on up. Literally, we don't know anybody in person. We just kind of give it away. Oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Just come on up here. Like, amen. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah. Join the panel. All right, now actual expertise, thank God. That's okay. right. Now, all right, it's all you. I can Tell us what the hell we're doing. <laughs> uh, can, I, can I say one more thing? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Right away. Um, also, in the future, consider um, either not filming these ones or like maybe just doing uh, like sound recording um, and also putting a sign in front of them that just let people know. And that's not just for sex work, that's for anything that's about security and internet freedom. I think that that's something that we should be aware of in this track. Oh. Well, that's just on that's me for not wearing my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> well, and in fairness, the video does usually just show our dumb asses, so it doesn't show the people in the back, and we. We've already given and away I, our I rights to privacy. And I talk for five minutes and people yeah. pass out. So. <laughs> so, all right. <laughs> cool. Uh, box is somewhere. Um, okay. Um, and then we'll move out. Well, I was, I was going to try and bring it up early. This isn't really a question. It's more of a statement. You were talking about the strict definition of, like, I, I guess the strict definition of sex trafficking across state lines. There's actually kind of an international uh, example of that. Usually there's a lot of um, independent sex workers, usually from... East Asia or Europe, they come over to the United States and they are there kind of under the suspicion that, oh, they're being trafficked, but in reality, it's all voluntary. And, they, and things like that get tied up in courts and, and, or... And, yeah. and that's, exactly why, that's exactly why everyone is simply backing away completely. Yep. Because until you know all the background facts, you have no way to know whether someone is a voluntary willing sex worker or a trafficked unwilling slavery sex worker yeah. and absent that knowledge you, I mean the, the, the statute the, the carve away of the safe harbor doesn't care about that mm -hmm. it cares about whether you did in fact affect that transaction not whether you had any way to know that that transaction was improper to begin with yeah, it's essentially a tool used by very socially conservative people to complete all prostitution or really uh, voluntary sex, sex with right. with yeah. sex trafficking. Right. Yeah, and so I will add this. The and details like, are a lot more murky. I will say, please, if if I get anything wrong, just don't got me. Just like tell me. No, I, I'll I just wait. You, I, you speak and I'll speak after you. It's I am, good. It's because good. I am here also. I didn't to learn. come to roast you. <laughs> I didn't come to roast you. No, no, I, oh, I have do. two older brothers. I'm used to getting roasted. Yeah, um, yeah, so I think what's important to keep in mind is that in the United States, fundamentally, our laws about sex and specifically about sex in exchange for something of economic value, for currency, for goods, for whatever, are fundamentally premised on the idea of victimhood. Um, and they're fundamentally tied into that narrative and that the idea no one would ever do this unless they don't have any other option. Uh, which isn't true, uh, you know, and and this is not to minimize. There are people who have been sex trafficked. You know, I'm not going to use the phrase legitimately because that's got its own whole fucking metric ton of baggage. But there are people who have been coerced into sex work. Um, that is a thing that does actually happen. Having said that, in an attempt to protect those people and failing in a lot of cases, because all it's done is push this stuff off of the web and onto the street and into the dark web where we cannot monitor it at all. Uh, it has also victimized people who are not being coerced into this, who are doing this voluntarily, who, you know, frankly, if you're fucking nine Randy and objectivist and you say, free market, you know, exchange for goods and services, you know, get your market value. This is it. You're living the libertarian ideal. Um, and you try fucking telling that to Ted Cruz's office. Uh, 
because trust me, I know people who have tried. Um, but yeah, I think like fundamentally there is like a cultural hang-up that we just have never, the laws, like, you can go in front of a judge and be like, no, your honor, I'm actually doing this on my own will. He'll be like, what nonsense, you know? And that's, people can't get their minds out of their rut. You know, we, we uh, I, I, more years ago than I choose to name, I was on one of these panels, had nothing to do with, with, with sex work. I don't even remember what it had anything to do with, to be perfectly honest. But I remember the quote, because tech has never let me forget it. But I said something about the American movie industry, and my, and my statement was, you can behead a million people, but God forbid you're a topless woman, because that's what kicks you over into the R rating. And that's American society. We, we, we are perfectly fine with kids seeing violence. We really don't like kids seeing boobs. We all like fucking, but we don't like telling people we like fucking. That's the, that, that's, that's the problem with the culture that is driving these rules, is that it is, it is still taking the repressive victim view and not really looking at the transactional economy. Tell us what we fucked up. Oh no, well, I don't. I don't want to frame it that way because I was really just like super excited to see this like being a thing at all, and also good timing because this was the first panel I made it to today. <laughs> nice. um, <laughs> We're glad you did. <laughs> um, so I, I want to shout out to the the folks who like snapped for other sex workers, and like I don't want to point at or even look at anybody, but like I see you. Um, but uh, the first thing I want to address is sex work versus sex trafficking. Um, and that was a great question because that's what comes up like all the time. Um, and conceptually, I think that that's really easy. Like if you can understand the difference between rape and sex, you can understand the difference between sex work and sex trafficking. Because like you're saying, it's just about consent. So the issue is like when we are trying to define it legally, it's being defined really loosely so that it can be like deployed as is useful to the state, you know, when it's convenient. So what does that end up meaning is arresting black and brown women, especially trans women, just for existing where they are in their neighborhoods because surprise, we just destroyed their neighborhood, there's gentrifiers moving in and your white neighbors are calling the cops on anybody on the street. So not only is trafficking deployed um, in like really, really harmful ways, it gets deployed against us in uh, really just preposterous ways that seem absurd because like if I were to be arrested, there's a very high likelihood that I could be charged with trafficking. Like if I were to be, wor if I were, in theory, working while I was here in Atlanta, um, I could be arrested for trafficking. Um, and thing about that is prostitution is a misdemeanor, but trafficking is a felony. So that really fucks up your life too. And so again, like guess who that ends up affecting the most? Um, and because it's defined so loosely, because solicitation is defined so loosely, things like carrying condoms can be used um, as evidence against you, things about the way that you dress. Definitely the way I'm dressed right now could be used against me in the court of law. Um, not so much the windbreaker, but I don't know if you saw the rest. Um, <laughs> but well, if, you, if, you, if you think about the public health implications of saying you can't have condoms on you or you're going to look like a sex worker, even if you're not one, like we know that bad things happen in public health and like STIs are transmitted, not just because people are having sex, but because people are having sex without the resources that they need to do it safely. Um, and so I think that when you look at every single part of these laws from top to bottom, they are so, so harmful. And it's clear that like people know, the people who write them know, they're not designed to actually help anybody. Um, and even the cops have admitted that Sesta and Fossa had made it harder for them to do their jobs, although fuck the cops. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that, 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 that's actually a great transition because I think the one thing that we should really focus on at some point in this panel is that SESTA FOSTA didn't work. I mean, no, we, we, we hand wave ourselves about what, it, uh, what it's supposed to do because we don't really know what it was supposed to do, but big picture, it was going to stop sex trafficking and we were going to save a bunch of kids and child pornography and yeah. 
And the reality is that, like Brandon said, all it did is push it off the web. We can't find it anymore. Before, you know, the police could look at images and there might be an ad on Backpage or a photo on Craigslist and somebody could say, I know that person. I know who that person is and I know they've been missing from my neighborhood for five years. They're on the milk jug I just drank from, right? I mean, that, that, that's, that's a way to, to find some of this unwilling, un, non-consensual behavior that we have now lost because all of that evidence is now gone and it's gone underground. It didn't go away. No one stopped trafficking, trafficking children, but we have now lost the ability to find it. And so what it has done is made the police's job more, more, more difficult. It's made the prosecutor's job more difficult because the evidence isn't there anymore. It used to be screen grab that page and now that's gone. So not only has it done all this other bad crap, but it didn't even do what it was supposed to do in the first place. I don't know where the box is. A couple of is. questions. Yeah. Right here. <laughs> okay, two part question. One, given that, uh, given that you've, uh, Meredith, you've said that people have been, uh, sex workers have been trying to move infrastructure to help other sex workers to say Austria and the Netherlands. Have they considered moving infrastructure to New Zealand where sex work has been fully decriminalized? And also second. And unionized. Uh, and unionized. Uh, and second, yeah. uh, I am a horny yeah, ass nerd. <laughs> and given and given all my years in the uh, security slash hacking spaces, I have a strong fuck the police streak. What is it that I can do to help uh, people out in this situation given my background and my abilities? That, I toss that one to you guys. Well, uh, let me talk about the legal aspect at the end, but I mean, I, I guess does anybody else want to talk about the New Zealand question? I didn't know New Zealand's on. I knew Austria I was on the list. Yeah. So New Zealand, New Zealand legalized uh, sex So they can be boring and middle class and enjoy all the boring middle class benefits and protections the rest of us get. But your big point was healthcare, was healthcare right. and unionization. Well, so how do we get that here? We do the same thing. I mean, the, the reality is, yeah, yeah. There, step one. So, 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 so yeah, you're, you're you're about to get my Anne Randian market driven <laughs> crap that Merrick wants to be crap DJ about. The Let's go. That's right, DJ the Libertarian. So the 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 the, the, the thing is that. It's hard to argue something like SESTA FOSTA is, is, is harming legitimate sex workers because we don't believe there's a legitimate sex worker. There's no such thing as a legitimate sex worker in as America as unless you concerned. happen to be in Reno. Okay, the, 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 the idea that you're pushing is I'm going to my, I'm going to my police officer or my representative or my you know, uh, senator and saying, hey, this act you've put in to harm this criminal is actually harming this criminal instead. That's the, that's the argument they hear, and so they don't care. So we've got to get to the point that that's not a criminal anymore, or that we can at least get them to, at the very least, decide that it's a different level of criminal. It, it's, not, it's not possible to make a legitimate argument that sex trafficking should be we, we should we should stop trying to affect sex trafficking because it's harming other criminal behavior. That's that's the problem that we can't get when we're pushing a lobbying issue to a to a legislator. So you, what you have to lobby first is why the fuck isn't this legal? Why can't I buy whatever I want to buy? I can buy everything else. Why can't I buy sex? There's no reason that we don't except that we just don't, and that's. That's where you need to start the conversation. Why aren't we because making this legal? Here's the thing. It? Here's the thing. Socially conservative Republicans. I'm going to pick on the Republicans. I don't. I normally work in D.C. I'm supposed to be nice to everybody. I'm not. Um, 
here's the thing. There's the, this is the same rationale as, and not in the obvious way, as uh, abstinence-only sex education and lack of access to abortions. And the idea is we will deter people from doing this behavior in the first place by making it as impossible and as scary as humanly possible. Which That's, is why I exist now. Right, which because is they garbage. They come see me after that. It's just hot flaming dumpster garbage and like nine or ten different levels minimum. Um, and, you know, I, it's this fundamental idea that like, you know, if you look at like absence only sex education, the idea is like, well, yeah, we know teens have been fucking like rabbits since we crawled out of the primordial soup until now. Uh, and that's the rationale. It's like, but we can stop it. <laughs> uh, and it's the same idea with sex work. It's like, yeah, this is, you know, it's called the world's oldest profession for a good fucking reason. Um, no pun intended. But, uh, you know, this idea that, like, well, if we make it as unattractive as humanly possible and as difficult to execute safely, that people will value their own safety over going into sex. It's this, like, perverse calculus. Um, and the idea that, like, you know, we just need to make this as scary and as backwater as humanly possible, and then somehow people will stop and no one will get hurt in the process. But that's, that is legitimately the calculus that... that and Sesta Fosta was categorically designed to go after sex work. Like, it was nominally designed to go after trafficking, and there were victims' advocates groups that, you know, it, it is... It, trafficking is, is a problem. Okay, this, is, this happens. It is a thing that actually happens. And, yes, there are all kinds of good intentions, and I'm not saying there's no legislative solution to this, and that there isn't some perfect version of, of Sesta Fosta that would go after just trafficking with all these negative knock-on effects thrown away. But, like, at the end of the day, the reason it got so much fucking support was because it ultimately went after sex work. That's it. There's my angry screed. Anyway. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I have sort of a question, but also, like, thank you so much for going up there. That's fucking awesome. Oh, um, so, yeah, so cops are not a thing that we should be going to for any goddamn reason because, first of all, they've been murdering sex workers. Second of all, they rape them with impunity. Uh, so why the hell are we going to rely on them for anything, especially since they are like a violent arm of the state? Uh, second of all, um, we definitely need to talk about legalization versus decriminalization. Legalization, bureaucracy, um, registering, monitoring of sex workers. We've been doing this for longer than anybody else can tell us what to do or how to do it. So why can we just not, why can we just not decriminalize this? because that will also help trafficking victims. Because we want taxes. <laughs> well, and I'll, I'll point this out. As someone who is, who is legitimately outside of my job, which occasionally takes me into the, you know, sort of orbit of sex work. Um, you know, I deal with Internet of Things security issues. So I was on a panel last year about uh, with the Internet of Dongs, uh, which is a great blog. Uh, they do IoT security testing on sex toys. Um, and it's, by the way, that blog is horrifying if you ever read it. Uh, no one designs with security in mind. If you get a no. dildo with a camera on it, buyer beware. Um, but, you know, as someone who only occasionally ends up in the orbit of sex work, like, what is just one of the, frankly, most interesting, coolest things to me is the fact that there are, like, standards of practice. <laughs> that Like, there are these, like, internal norms that people talk to each other about and there's this sort of shared like best practices and that's crazy because this is all so pushed out of the mainstream of debate that even someone like me and I consider myself like pretty open minded and like I get down rabbit hole deep dives pretty frequently like doesn't run across that ever um, because there is this social pressure to keep it so invisible and out of the mainstream which is garbage but you all know that would it be okay if I answered some of the stuff okay yeah, go for please. it please um all right, so I tried to make myself some notes and I think I confused myself more. Um, I, I wanna share, uh, TJ, right? Yep. Okay, I also realized I forgot to introduce myself. Hey everybody, um, I'm Jinx Lier. Uh, I use she, her pronouns and I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I totally did not expect this at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so a couple things. Uh, so I really want I want to directly challenge you about the like we can't lobby for this first. We have to lobby for for decrim first. And I'm gonna say I know that we don't have to do that first because on June second I was part of the first ever sex worker lobby day that was nationwide, and I was in the DC team, and I was actually one of. Um, a couple dozen sex workers who talked to more than 30 representatives that day. Um, and so 
that was a real thing that happened. There's actually a really uh, obnoxious clickbait title uh, reason article called Jinx the Anarchist Sex Worker Goes to Washington. Nice. If you want to see me sweating in the D.C. heat. Um, as far as um, Mer what Meredith was talking about, I think is really important because you're talking about harm reduction and the lack of understanding of harm reduction, which is something that I touched on as well, which is we're going to pretend that people don't, we don't like this behavior. So we're going to pretend that people don't do it. And the state is going to pretend that people don't do it. And if people die, then so be it. And that's how we talk about um, intravenous drug use, because we know that most of the negative health effects that are associated with intravenous drug use are not themselves the drugs. It is the conditions under which the drugs are done, again, coming back to the same thing as it is with condoms, which is why it's so important to have things like needle exchanges. Um, but yeah, I mean, if there, you can't law, outlaw abortion, but you can outlaw safe abortions. You can't outlaw sex work, but you can make sex work really, really dangerous. And one thing that I don't think gets brought up enough in this, we are talking a lot about um, like advertising sites and like, oh no, we can't make money. And like, that's really, really serious. But something that doesn't get stressed enough is that like screening is now so much harder. Like I really cannot stress that enough. Every time I go to open an app and it doesn't work, the first thing I think of is did this app just get deleted? Is it not on the Play Store anymore? How many people are gonna die as a result of this? Because those are the consequences that we're dealing with. Um, those, it's very, very real. People died because of this within 48 hours. There was a woman who was a sex worker who was found dismembered um, in a park. Um, and because people have to make dangerous decisions, and sorry for not trigger warning that, you guys. Um, but people have to make dangerous decisions when they're put in terrible places. So guess the fuck what? Ironically enough, this brought the pimps out because they knew that we no longer had access to the actual resources that we used to keep track of their asses. Like, when you delete a blacklist, you delete records of all of the people that have been hurt by that. That's saying not just we you know, oops, we made a bill and it doesn't actually help people who are being sex trafficked. That's genocide of sex workers. That's what we're really talking about. Um, and I think that my, my first question back at people when they talk about, oh, well, like, yeah, trafficking is really real. But in the United States, if you want to talk about trafficking, the first two things that you need to talk about are agricultural and domestic labor. Who picks your berries? Who made your shirts? You know, those people, there are way more of those people. And by those people, that's a terrible way to say that. But um, there are way more people who are here under conditions that are deemed illegal and their lives are deemed illegal and devalued. And that happens so much more in other industries than it actually does in sex trafficking. As far as how you can support us, you can listen to us, you can do stuff like this right now. You can interrupt your friends when they make really fucked up jokes. You can contact your favorite creators when they make really uh, shitty dead hooker jokes because guess what, that leads to our actual deaths. Um, and, uh, yeah, you can, you know, pay us for our cool shit. <laughs> Thank you for letting me talk. Hi, so, sorry, I'm not used to this. Um, you've talked a bit about um, advertising forums and, and forums that maybe people converse on, but I wanted to touch a bit and ask a bit on other services that might support uh, sex workers and how, uh, how SESTA FOSTA has um, affected them. Uh, my personal background is that I am a former sex worker. I'm retired. Um, thank you. I, uh, I also am a certified coach, and I've realized that these are really isolated people. And I've done this quietly. I've quietly supported other sex workers and coached them while I was working. And then once I retired, I wanted to create a website. But I'm kind of terrified, because like, I don't know 
like for photographers or people like myself or other people, how does this? How can you protect yourself when it's a gobbledygook sort of law? Well, there's your answer right there. Even Google or Bank of America or Chase or or, or Facebook can't figure that out. There, there's not a great answer to that because the 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 problem with the breadth of the phrasing is, what's what, what's enabling? Is your landlord enabling you if yeah. you know you've got a house that you have sex with people in? Yeah, potentially. Is your is your photographer enabling you? Sure, because that's where the picture's going up. All all of this, all of this is potentially impacted, and that's why it's having such a dramatic and and immediate effect on. On, on legitimate sex work, it really is. It really is such a broad law that there is nothing that you can do. Literally, we are sitting here today talking about sex work not as the goddamn devil. We are enabling it. We're probably going to be prosecuted under sex as soon as we walk out of this room. So the 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 and the fun, the the tragic thing is like. We can joke about that because our odds of actually getting prosecuted are close to nothing uh, because we are incredibly privileged positions to be able right. to, to crack jokes about this, but it's, it's genuinely like no one knows the limits of this law yet. Um, and unfortunately, as with much of American law, the courts are kind of, you know, there's a shitty law, they punch it to the courts to figure it out, which means that something has to happen. Someone's ass has to end up in court and they have to have a good enough funded challenge to it. Now, luckily, EFF is suing about this. Um, I am not familiar with the case, so I can't give you any of the details about it. Um, you know, go support them. Like, kick, kick a couple of dollars their way if you can. They do great work. Um, but it's going to be a long time before anyone concretely knows what this law actually means for anyone, let alone, you know, even the... And the Googles and the Facebooks and the Yahoos and the Amazons of the world have a team of lawyers, and they can't figure this shit out. Right. They have a team of lawyers that were involved in drafting the bill, and they cannot figure out what they are and are not liable for. And, you know, and the, EFF, the, the EFF suit is just saying it's unconstitutional under the First and Fifth Amendment. All that means is this, if they're successful, there's a big if, if they're successful, this particular version of sesta Fosta goes away, and we're left back with whatever they come up with next. Um, it's not necessarily... Um, you know the the the, the antidote. The, the litigation doesn't fix everything. It maybe it maybe makes things more complicated. It, it at most gets you a second bite at the apple yeah. to write legislation about this. And the unfortunate reality, uh, and unfortunate is probably too weak of a word here, is that by the time that happens, we will have had several years uh, worth of fallout from yep. this law. Um, and so there there will be a body count, essentially, from this law before we get around to, there is. to revising yeah. it. There already is. Um, and it's it's going to grow before it stops. And so the, the, the thing I want to push here is, and I have said this at every panel, I'm going to say it at every panel next year and every panel after that, but the, 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 the way that you involve yourself is get involved. Uh, be involved in the making of these laws. Be involved in the next bite at the apple. Be in contact with your representatives. Be in contact with your senators, federally and state, and locally. Call your councilman. Mm -hmm. You know, want to decriminalize something? Decriminalize it in your neighborhood. Yeah. Do do everything you can to be a good, involved citizen. And, and I will I will just say that this year, Nerd Vote is literally right outside. They are they are at a table at the end of the hall. Now they're not there now because it's ten o'clock. But tomorrow they'll be back at that table, and if you're not registered to vote, go register to vote. And if you are registered to vote, drag one of your friends who isn't over there to register to vote. And then fucking vote. I don't care how you vote. I'm not going to tell you to vote my way or their way or here way or whatever because I don't care. Just Ask them be about involved. this shit. Have this be have sex work. Have internet freedom be a, a a platform or a point upon which you judge your elected representatives. Like call them and ask them about it. Cause look, I'm telling you, I have sat in offices with Congress people and said, Hi, I'm a sex worker and like I'm here to talk about being your constituent. And it's fucking hard and I don't want to do it by myself. So we need y'all to do it so that we don't out ourselves just by nature of the fact that we give a shit. And fun, here's a fun experiment. Next time your representative comes home for a town hall, ask him. Yeah. If, yeah. If, yeah. Sometimes they do, <laughs> not all of them. Well, like, get, I, up, I have, get up with them like, well... I have two senators and one house of representatives. All right. Every person, and you 
know them, they have these emails, they have ways to contact them, yep. and they have town halls. Stand if up, you don't know, get all their contact information is on the websites. Go find, go find the internet. That's still there. Get, get at the, I specific, I, I their assistants in their offices like have to be nice to you, and it's like sometimes you can tell once they notice what you're there for that it's like changes. Their attitude is like a little different, but they like pretty much have to give you like coffee and water and stuff. So, if you're from Texas, the Texas delegation is Dr Pepper in all of its fridges. I'm not making this oh up. My God. Um, oh, there's like an unofficial Texas. list of what offices have the best snack foods. Uh, yeah. yeah, no. And I, the reason I single out the town hall is because at town halls there are cameras, mm -hmm. and cameras means there's video evidence of their answer uh, somewhere. Now they might completely fuck it up uh, and say something real dumb, in which case, great, it's on video. Uh, maybe they'll actually think about what comes out of their mouth before they say anything, in which case, great. Uh, you know, But this is a question that doesn't enter into the natural discourse. I can guarantee you this is not one they're going to have prepped for ahead of time. Mm -mm. They're gonna, which they is are, all the better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So you get some unvarnished reaction Ask out of Ask them about Sessafasa in particular and be ready for like a blank, confused oh, look to, to, yeah. to like pass across their faces. Also, like, I just want to say that this is in part addressing the question from the really wonderful veteran uh, sex worker who had been in the back. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, is that we really need people who aren't sex workers to be involved in it, you know, be, and not like you have to become a sex worker. That's not what I meant. But um, although you're welcome to, although I can't tell you about that because that's trafficking. Um, I wish I was joking. But just like, you know, say nice things about sex workers from time to time. You can get, literally get bumper stickers that say, be nice to sex workers, smiley face. You know, continue doing, they're honestly, babe, they're probably, and sorry, that was really presumptuous. Honestly, they're probably not coming for you. They're not like, they're not coming for people individually. You know, this is just part of this bigger picture that we are talking about. The sex workers, like, we are the canaries in the coal mine, and you know what happens that the canaries die, but, like, it's not... That doesn't make what TJ is saying any less true about, like, this being the first in a huge step that, like, it doesn't have to sound like a conspiracy. You don't have to make this shit up. Like, this and net neutrality go hand in hand. And just Tomorrow, to 4 o'clock. And to, yeah, yeah. Um, in case you haven't heard me and TJ talk enough, uh, the uh, and just and this just came to mind. So if you did set up a website uh, to you know post photos or do any kind of sort of sex worker outreach or anything like that, uh, the more likely scenario is that whatever web service is hosting you would take it down. Uh, they'd withdraw their support. That mm -hmm. is that is almost. Right guaranteed to be the first thing that happens. Um, yeah. So it would not even get to the point where the cops are coming after you. The cops are probably going to come after anyone who's, because you're just going to keep getting shunted off of services. That's the point of criminalizing the hosts is so that they self-censor and they scare us all off. Yep. And then grossly and overcorrect in the process. Shoved into the shadows and that's where we want it. Welcome to America. Ah, this is uplifting. <laughs> ah! Anything on a high note. <laughs> Yay! Alcohol! You, you didn't start? I started already. <laughs> Yay! I have posters and prints for sale. That's a high note. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> it's way better than my last word. Thank you awesome. so much. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. This was awesome. Uh, yeah. Oh, I don't know. He gave us a mm, super super short final thoughts. Uh, Sesta Fasta is fucked up. Um, <laughs> might be the understatement of the year. Um, no, get involved. Get involved. Say positive things about sex workers. You fucking go on Facebook and share articles about how Sesta and Fasta have, have like, you know, literally t ripped up a body count. I guarantee you, most people, unless you happen to move in, like, the particular kinds of circles that tend to be very sex positive, like, I guarantee you probably eight out of ten people, like, in your family or on Thanksgiving dinner have never thought about this. Uh, they don't think about sex workers as people if they think about them at all. Uh, so just like fucking sign, use your platform and put some sunlight on it. Final thoughts. Fucking vote. I can't top that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? Direct action gets the goods. Yeah, it does. <laughs> vote also, but... 
but you know. Yeah, no. When I when <laughs> Why I say not vote, both? <laughs> also contact your contact your senator, contact your representative, call everybody. Oh, and definitely ask Grandpa about sex workers at Thanksgiving dinner. Oh, That's, absolutely. That is the way to go. Have those conversations so that we don't have to. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Uh, cool. We've been cut off, but you guys can come up. Now. Yeah, we got we got the axe. <laughs>